Welcome to this lecture on colonialism, immigration and the making of British citizenship. One of the objectives of the Connected Sociologies curriculum project is to examine how colonial legacies shape contemporary social and political issues. In this talk, I want to show how Britain's colonial and post-colonial history has shaped its citizenship regime. Citizenship can be understood as membership of a political community. It's a legal status with rights attached. It cannot be separated, I want to argue, from wider political projects of nation and of empire. I want to discuss today how colonial and post-colonial immigration shaped the development of what we now call British citizenship and how national citizenship in Britain is inseparable from colonial and post-colonial conceptions of identity and belonging. As we'll see, the first mention of citizenship in UK law was explicitly colonial. Its evolution into a national citizenship was shaped by responses to post-colonial immigration and, as revealed by the Windrush scandal, which I'll come back to towards the end, it has ongoing legacies. I'd like to start by pointing out that national citizenship is an arriviste in British legal history. Citizenship in Britain, founded upon a national identity and restricted in its substance, i.e. the rights that it grants or entails, to nationals, is a recent invention. For the majority of their history, the British were subjects, not citizens. Living in a monarchy, undisturbed by revolution, British subjects became citizens only after the Second World War. And when citizenship was first created, it was not as a national citizenship. The citizenship created in 1948 was explicitly colonial. This had profound and unforeseen consequences, especially for immigration policy, which drove the UK to restrict the rights of colonial citizens and eventually create a national citizenship. It was only in 1981 that British citizenship was finally defined in law. While citizenship rights, including the right of abode, had by then been circumscribed by immigration legislation, it was only once Britain tilted towards Europe that it carved out an exclusive legal definition of what it means to be a British citizen. British citizenship, therefore, was chiselled out of the ruins of empire. It can't be understood, not in terms of its genesis, nor its evolution, nor its contemporary effects, independent of our colonial and post-colonial histories. The story I want to tell begins in 1948, which in a nice historical coincidence was also the year that the Empire Windrush docked in London with 492 Jamaicans on board. Earlier that year, the British government had legislated to create citizenship for the first time. The British Nationality Act of 1948 did not, however, create a British citizenship. Rather, it created a single legal status for all persons born in the UK or one of its colonies. This was called Citizenship of the United Kingdom and Colonies, or CUKC. Its intent was precisely to shore up colonial and post-colonial ties through the empire and the emergent Commonwealth. So there was no revolution or constitutional convention for British subjects as they became citizens. Instead, they were turned into citizens by an act of parliament, which was motivated by imperial realpolitik and which defined citizenship in colonial terms. Whether born in Britain or one of its colonies, all CUKCs had the same status. And with the same status came identical rights. All CUKCs enjoyed what was called the right of abode, that is, the right to enter and stay legally in the UK. They were not subject to immigration control. They could move, they could migrate to Britain freely. It's amazing in hindsight that the implication of this was barely discussed at the time. I think the main reason for this was that the 1948 Act did not in fact change the substantive position of British subjects born in the colonies, who already under common law had the right of entry to the UK. Up until this point, however, most hadn't acted on this right, and the, Brit uh, the British Nationality Act was seen in relatively technical terms. However, by enshrining the right of abode as a right of colonial citizenship, it would have, as we'll see, profound consequences. So when we talk about migration from the Caribbean and South Asia during the 1950s and early 1960s, it's important to remember that it was, strictly speaking, not immigration at all, but rather colonial citizens exercising their right of abode 
in the UK. Now, politically at the time and since, it was talked about as new Commonwealth or sometimes at the time, colored immigration. But up until the early 1960s, it is more accurately understood as colonial citizens exercising their rights to migrate within a colonial polity. One of the myths of recent British history is that most of these migrants were invited to the UK to work, for example, in the National Health Service or London Transport. Now, while there were some recruitment schemes for nurses and other workers, these programmes are relatively small, and most CUKCs arrived in Britain under their own steam, looking for work and a new life in the motherland that they would have heard about in imperial propaganda, or perhaps experienced while they were stationed in Europe fighting to defend the empire during the Second World War. Most migrants were in fact not invited or even particularly welcomed. In fact, they often met a, ho a hostile response. Amongst political elites, concern about coloured immigration, as it was called, was not primarily driven by economics. As research that I and many others have done shows, at the highest levels of government, politicians expressed their fears about Britain becoming a multiracial society. As immigration increased during the 1950s, successive Conservative governments tried to restrict entry using, initially at least, administrative measures. When this proved unsuccessful in reducing numbers, the government introduced, for the first time since the Second World War, a significant piece of immigration legislation. The Commonwealth Immigrants Act of 1962 was designed precisely to prevent colonial CUKCs who were born outside the UK from migrating to Britain. This was done by removing the right to abode from CUKCs born outside the UK, which made them subject to immigration control. The Act did create some labour migrant quotas so that colonial immigration, as it was now, wasn't halted altogether, but the right to migrate was abolished. Just six years later, another piece of restrictive legislation, the 1968 Commonwealth Immigrants Act, this time passed uh, by a Labour government, was passed rapidly in response to the arrival of so-called Kenyan Asians who were fleeing Kenyatta's Africanization programme. It was during the parliamentary debates on this piece of legislation that the Home Secretary, Jim Callaghan, coined an extraordinary phrase. The intention of this legislation was, he said, to prevent the immigration of, and I quote, citizens who do not belong. Let's let that phrase sink in, citizens who do not belong. So after 1968, only those CUKCs with a close connection to the UK, which was defined by whether they or their parent or grandparent was born in the UK, enjoyed the right of abode. This had the intended effect of allowing immigration by citizens of the so-called old Commonwealth, many of whom had direct ancestry and who were mostly white, while making the mostly non-white new Commonwealth subject to control. In ways that have many parallels with debates about the so-called Red Wall today, Labour was divided between those like Callaghan, who saw a restrictive approach to immigration as politically necessary, and those who were supportive of immigration and thought that the 1968 Act was a betrayal of the Kenyan Asians. The latter group offered race relations legislation as a quid pro quo for immigration controls in what became known as the limitation integration equation. In summary, during the 1960s and 70s then, successive British governments, both Conservative and Labour, restricted what they called coloured immigration by carving out a narrow definition of national belonging from an expansive definition of colonial citizenship. Citizenship rights were restricted to those defined as belonging. Those who were excised as citizens who do not belong were denied rights that usually attached to citizenship without their citizenship being denied. Thus, the narrowing of citizenship rights for CUKCs born outside the UK was driven clearly by an immigration control agenda. 1968 was, of course, the year in which Enoch Powell delivered his infamous Rivers of Blood speech. Powell was, in fact, unusual amongst Conservatives and that his nationalism, his opposition to immigration, was shorn of imperial nostalgia. He'd once been an ardent supporter of the British Empire, but he believed that nationalist movements and colonial independence meant that the British nation must now stand apart from its former colonies. 
but many other conservatives remain deeply nostalgic for empire. This nostalgia, combined with a hard-headed politics of decolonization, explains why colonial citizenship wasn't abolished altogether. Britain essentially tried to have its cake and eat it too. It wanted the legal and symbolic glue of CUKC, citizenship of the United Kingdom and colonies, without the consequences of colonial citizenship rights, i.e. migration. As the government sought to replace formal empire with an informal sphere of influence in the Commonwealth, abolishing CUKC would have undermined attempts to continue influence through the Commonwealth. What changed? In short, as growing numbers of colonies achieved independence, Britain turned its attentions from its former empire to the European project. Britain's entry into the EEA, as it was then, in 1973, represented a fundamental realignment of the British state. The turn to Europe meant that the political arguments for retaining CUKC, which was by then largely symbolic and carried no rights for holders born outside the UK, dropped away. In the late 1970s, both Labour and the Conservatives began considering changes to nationality law. The British Nationality Act of 1981 finally abolished CUKC and established a British citizenship with the right of abode. The Green Paper which preceded that legislation was entitled, Who Do We Think We Are? The answer given was that this we no longer included post-colonial subjects outside the UK most of whom were now formally removed from UK citizenship. As well as defining British citizenship, the British Nationality Act of 1981 also removed the use solely provisions of UK law, under which anyone born in the UK or colonies had been automatically entitled to CUKC status. The Act introduced a requirement that to acquire British citizenship, at least one parent of a UK born child must be a British citizen or a permanent resident. Colonial vestiges weren't entirely expunged from British nationality law. The 1981 Act created two other citizenship categories, British overseas citizenship and British dependent territory citizenship. Both were, however, largely symbolic. They didn't carry the right of abode in the UK and they weren't recognised for immigration control purposes by most other countries. So the creation and evolution of citizenship in Britain has always been tied up with wider historical and political structures, colonial, post-colonial and European. There are many contemporary legacies of this complex history. I'd like briefly to discuss the most egregious recent example, namely the Windrush scandal. This scandal emerged in 2017 after it became clear that hundreds of black Britons had been wrongfully detained, deported or had their rights denied. At least 83 people were wrongfully deported, and many more were imprisoned, detained under immigration charges, or refused health care or other benefits to which they were entitled. It was the hostile environment policies created during Theresa May's tenure as Home Secretary that were the immediate cause of the scandal. These policies, put into law by the 2014 Immigration Act, aimed to create, as May put it, a really hostile environment for illegal immigrants. And it did that by excluding them from access to work, housing, healthcare, and public services. The hostile environment was intended to increase voluntary deportation, as the Home Office referred to it, facilitate the identification and forced removal of those without a right to remain, and act as a deterrent to future migrants as hostility became institutionalized across public and private spheres. To access a range of services, people were required to evidence their right to live in the UK, while landlords, doctors, banks, educators, etc., were legally required to check immigration status. In effect, non-state actors were co-opted to perform immigration control functions, checking the status of those who sought their help or their business. Members of the Windrush generation, who had every right to be in the UK, became the targets of hostility as a consequence of the colonial citizenship that had enabled their entry and residence. Many people who had migrated to Britain from the Caribbean, as adults or often as children, did so without passports. Under the laws at the time, they had a legal right to enter the UK and were not required to provide any documentation. As we've seen, subsequent immigration legislation removed the right of entry from CUKCs born outside the UK 
but it also extended a right to remain to those who had already migrated before 1973. This was an automatic right and no documentation was required or given by the Home Office to these people. For the next four decades or so, many of them continued to live and work in Britain in the belief that they were British. As the hostile environment policies increasingly required people to prove their immigration status, members of the Windrush generation found themselves unable to produce the newly required documentation. Many were refused public services or denied benefits. Others were sent letters by the Home Office incorrectly telling them that they had no right to be in the UK. Some were detained under the false charge that they were in violation of the immigration rules. And as I mentioned already, at least 83 people were wrongfully deported. I can't go further into what this says about parts of the British state's attitudes towards immigrants and black Britons. Lives and livelihoods were ruined by a dysfunctional system that was at best ignorant, but often much worse. Simply point out that this episode is one instance, particularly dramatic instance, of how the colonial past haunts contemporary Britain. The Windrush scandal was, in essence, the collision of contemporary immigration policies, the hostile environment, with the historical legacy of Britain's post-colonial citizenship regime. Now, I focused um, for most of this talk on how Britain's colonial project structured its citizenship regime and how the exercise of rights by colonial citizens led to a narrowing and eventual abolition of colonial citizenship. I'd like to conclude with a brief reflection on a more recent but similarly profound transformation of British citizenship, that brought about by Britain's entry and its recent exit from the European Union. Now, of course, there are really important differences between the narrowing of citizenship that attended Britain's retreat from empire and its departure from the EU. The former was a reaction by the British state to the exercise of rights by subaltern peoples during the collapse of the colonial project that was based on violence, domination and appropriation. The latter entailed voluntary withdrawal from a legal order driven by domestic politics. One involved stripping only those colonial others of rights Brexit involves a diminution of rights for both British and European citizens. But there is both a conceptual and substantial similarity that I'd like to point out. Conceptually, both cases reveal how membership and rights are shaped by political projects beyond the nation. Citizenship may be the hallmark of membership in the modern nation state, but citizenship as both status and rights cannot be separated from political projects that extend beyond the nation, whether that be imperial or supranational. And it might also be said, though I don't have the time to go into this here, that many of the most vociferous Brexiteers exhibit either nostalgia or a form of futurism about the possibilities of resuscitating Britain's imperial role. This is the so-called Empire, Empire 2.0, as one civil servant apparently uh, put it. In terms of the substantial similarity, it's really striking how immigration was the political motor in both cases. When the UK joined Europe in 1973, it had had few implications for citizenship. However, the creation of European citizenship by the 1992 Maastricht Treaty added a new transnational dimension to British citizenship. From this point onwards, British citizenship entailed supplementary rights of European citizenship, including the right to live and work across the EU. This, of course, cut both ways, so that citizens of other EU member states also acquired rights to live in the UK. This had little immediate impact, but after EU enlargement in 2004, when substantial numbers of new European citizens, particularly from Central and Eastern Europe, moved to Britain, a new form of anti-immigration politics developed, focused this time on free movement. Opponents of the European Union, most obviously Nigel Farage, saw an opportunity to reframe and mobilize opposition to Europe through the lens of anti-immigrant politics. And as we know, immigration was central to the Leave campaign in 2016, and it was the most important factor for many people who voted Leave. So in both cases, an expansive definition of citizenship that extended rights beyond British nationals was unmade by the politics of immigration. In the 1950s and 60s, mobilization against colonial migration. Then after 2004, mobilization against European free movement. And in both cases, the political opposition to immigration that developed led to a narrowing and a circumscription of rights. The removal of rights from colonial citizens, and now the removal of rights from European citizens to migrate to Britain, and of course, uh, of Britons to move to Europe.
So I began by observing that citizenship can be understood as membership of a political community. It's a legal status with rights attached. In the famous words of Hannah Arendt, citizenship can be thought of as the right to have rights. Citizenship is inseparable from how a political community defines and imagines itself, who it considers to belong, and who it considers entitled to rights. Indeed, citizenship can be thought of as the formal definition of membership and of belonging. As in other European countries, the national, transnational, and the colonial projects of the British state have shaped and in turn been shaped by how it defines citizenship. And the politics of immigration control has driven a, a narrowing of membership and rights, not once, but now twice. First, as I've explored during the post-war period, as the rights of citizens who do not belong were removed and colonial was replaced by national citizenship. And most recently, as British citizenship has been decoupled from EU citizenship and its rights of free movement. Like so many other aspects of British politics and society, the making and remaking of British citizenship can only be understood as part of a colonial and post-colonial politics. Thank you.